The Price is the best mission in the game. The hydraulic bridge between the Warren and Historic District is quickly gotten out of the way and just used to start the mission and lead into the meat of it. This bridge is damaged and barely holding together. It's visual symbolism of how things have changed for Cole from here to here. The Historic District has been taken over by the First Sons, the secret organization run by Kessler who built the Ray Sphere and orchestrated the blast. Like I said before, they're scientifically advanced but also old-fashioned in ideals and origin. In John's Dead Drops, you can learn about their fascinating backstory that blends fiction with real-world events and history. The origin of the First Sons dates back to medieval Europe, exact date unknown. Because they were viewed as witches or in league with the devil, they were forced to flee to the New World in the 17th century. This is probably apocryphal, but current members claim responsibility for what happened in Salem in 1692 and 93. They're basically the Illuminati. Kessler has made a few appearances as a mysterious bad man in the story so far, but this is his full introduction. Our time together is drawing to a close, Cole, and I fear that you're still not ready to face what is coming. So I've decided to accelerate things, evolve or die as they say. He's had this all planned out, but why? Shall we begin? The big mystery becomes even more interesting as you get closer to the answers. He's captured Trish most likely with help from Zeke and is threatening to kill her if Cole is unable to rescue innocent people from the bombs he set up across the island. The player is being forced to do good even if they are evil. Kessler acknowledges this and taunts Cole by asking him, Did you save him because it was the right thing to do? Or because you're trying to protect Trish? Kessler sees Cole as a test subject in an experiment, similar to the animals he tested the race for on. Test subject number 345A is exhibiting remarkable signs of progress. Kessler is manipulative, intelligent, and brutal. He's evil, but he's doing what he's doing to make a point. His moral perspective is that sacrificing a few innocent people to save many is what needs to be done for the greater good. Why? We'll find out soon. The First Sun's enemies are mostly the same as what we've seen before, but with more health. These are the new ones. There are two drones, one of which is a suicide bomber and the other fires grenades at you. Both can turn invisible, but a faint distorted outline can be seen. Their version of the shotgun guy is a conduit who's also able to turn invisible. These guys can be annoying when you're in a fight with many enemies and they come out of nowhere, do a ton of damage to you, and stun you. This is literally unfair to a degree. Thankfully, their use is limited, the outline is pretty noticeable if you're paying attention, and the drones make a constant humming noise. But the point in the story is that Kessler is giving Cole unfair challenges to prepare him for something. So it's kind of fitting. Another conduit can make a giant hologram around itself that is fast and does melee damage. It has low health but can be difficult to hit because you have to hit the body of the conduit, not the body of the hologram. If you don't finish off this enemy, they can get back up after being taken down. The First Sons have also placed mines on the rooftops of many buildings in the historic districts. You have to be careful and listen for their beeping. This adds another small challenge to traversing the island, fitting with Kessler wanting to challenge Cole. Trish, the only person Cole still loves and trusts, is in danger. These high stakes are felt in the gameplay. Kessler accelerates things, and the difficulty spikes here. The game has prepared you by giving you the shield, which is very powerful. Many new, difficult enemies fight you at once, and you're being timed to disable bombs, which you do by draining them, a great use of something you already do all the time. Plus, it gives you health and energy to recover from the difficult fight you were just in and prepare for the next one. When you defuse a bomb, more enemies spawn, regardless of how many of the previous ones you've defeated. You are given the dilemma of balancing disarming the bombs on time and not being overwhelmed by enemies. And dilemmas are what this mission is all about. Kessler gives you the most morally complex karma choice in the game, to either save Trish or six doctors. Trish is a doctor too, but ultimately six doctors will be able to save more lives in the future than just one. Kessler is trying to teach Cole to understand his morals of sacrificing a few people to save many. The karma system considers it good to save the doctors, which is so interesting because it's what the main villain wants. Choosing to save Trish is selfish, I suppose, but at the same time, it's completely understandable and probably what most people would do. Trish! Who the hell's Trish? Get me out of this! Trish! 
Even if you choose to save her, she dies. Kessler has been watching the choices Cole has made and knew what he would choose. His goal is not only to teach Cole a lesson, but also to kill Trish so Cole has no emotional attachments. All of that being said, if you make good choices up until this point and then choose to save Trish, she still dies which doesn't make any sense. The good version of her death cutscene plays, but this time she was on the roof with the doctors like on Evil Karma, except it doesn't make sense that Kessler would know to put her there based on your actions. But most good players wouldn't suddenly make an evil choice this late in the game. There are no gameplay consequences for this choice, but it is easily more interesting than any other choice in the game from a story perspective. It's sorta unfortunate that it has to be tied down to the karma system instead of letting the choices be more natural like this one. Gameplay is used very well when it comes to how you make your choice. Unlike many other choices in the game, time doesn't stop for Cole to think about what he should do and you don't choose by pressing a button. You are given limited time to think and have to make the choice by climbing one of the two buildings the hostages are on top of, which are clearly lit up with spotlights so you know where to go. While you climb, Kessler continues to speak to Cole and makes you unsure of what you are choosing. I wish there was some other way. That Trish didn't have to die. She's such a special woman. If you choose to save the doctors, Trish's death is heartbreaking, but at least she loved and believed in you. If you choose to save her, she hates who you've become. For a second she sprung to life, just long enough to say that she was ashamed of what I'd become. That God had given me these powers and I'd squandered them, hurting others and thinking only of myself. I buried her in the park alongside others who died since the blast. Kessler's gonna pay for this. I'm gonna find that sick bastard, and I'm gonna kill him. This is Cole's biggest loss and lowest point. He gains a true hate for Kessler that motivates him for revenge even when he's a good guy. All that Cole had worked to get back with his relationship is now gone again. It doesn't help that John barely shows any sympathy. They still have a goal and must stay focused, which is what John's best at. Where the hell were you? If you'd only helped out, Trish might still be alive. Cole blames him for Trish's death at first, just like Trish blamed Cole for Amy's death in the start of the game. Now he finally understands how she felt. There's one last section of the city that needs to be powered on, and one last power for Cole. The Lightning Storm. And if I get burned, at least we were electrified. Sucker Punch would be insane to make a video game where you have electric superpowers and not have this power. It works great as a final move you get and is the perfect tool for Cole to exact his revenge. He calls down lightning from above which instantly kills enemies. It's so destructive and satisfying. The storm travels forward and you control where it goes by tilting the controller. Oftentimes motion controls are annoying and not precise. But in this case, it never feels that way and is a good idea for how to control this power, making it feel more intimate and in tune with Cole's vengeance. Also, isn't it just perfect that you press down on the D-pad to do this move? The storm is overpowered, but not too much. You can't move while using it and it has a high energy cost. The game is still difficult, but makes you feel extremely powerful at the same time. Kessler continues to taunt and test Cole to prepare him to save the world. He wants Cole to keep going even if everyone is against him, so he is using a form of Sasha's mind control toxin to turn everyone in the city against Cole, who has to safely destroy the balloon spreading it. Getting on the balloons can be a bit annoying because you're encouraged to do it quickly and then you mess up. This mission is mostly fun, but is really just filler. Listen man, I didn't know what was gonna happen with Trish, I swear it. Zeke feels terrible about what he did and calls Cole a few times to apologize, but Cole is busy and not ready to forgive him anytime soon. I've got nothing to say to you, Zeke. As far as I'm concerned, you killed Trish. Moya calls too and tries in vain to get Cole back on her side. The Ray Sphere isn't a weapon of mass destruction, it's a weapon of ultimate destruction. You've got to find it and give it to me. I can lock it up. Make sure no one gets their hands on it. She begs him to give the sphere to her, but she lied to him. And Cole has absolutely no room for people he can't trust anymore. And therein lies the issue. Friends don't try to trick you. Get you on the phone and mind twist you. Goodbye, Moya. No! The game crashed and froze my PS3 just as I landed perfectly in the nick of time on the last balloon! 
Fuck! John has prepared a helicopter with equipment to relocate the sphere, but needs coal to destroy Kessler's jammers that are blocking the signal. The vehicle parts of this mission are not very good. The helicopter cannot stop like the bus could, so incoming rockets just hit you before you know they're coming. But the ground fights during this mission are really great, featuring difficult mixtures of first sons. John finds the race sphere again, and now the military is finally taking some action. See those jets, Cole? They're hitting targets all across the city, preparing the way for a ground invasion. The first sons are fighting them, and you're in the midst of this epic battle having to destroy the anti-air cannons for John's helicopter. For the most part, it's a better strategy to just go for the guns than to kill everyone. It's a fast-paced scramble and really shows how the situation is out of Cole's hands at this point. You have to chase down the sphere one last time, and then fight your way to it and the last fight with normal enemies in the main story. The dock fight puts all your skills to the test. Oh, wait, I already talked about it at the start of the review. Here we are, our last karma choice. Destroy the race sphere or use it again to become more powerful. The ultimate test of selfishness. Except it's way too late in the game to switch sides, so who even cares? Regardless of your choice, the sphere malfunctions and explodes, killing John. This choice does have some cool effects on evil though. Cole's lightning turns black and red and you get a large amount of XP. It makes sense that you don't really become that much more powerful because the sphere didn't work right. I think Kessler got the sphere to work that one time, but it kinda broke it and he was never able or needed to fix it. Although Kessler has up to this point wanted Cole to do the selfless thing, this time he wants the opposite because becoming more powerful would help save the world. You were right trying to use it again. That's the kind of thinking that will help you face what's coming. And that's pretty interesting. John's pulled in and it tears him apart. And I run. John and the race sphere are gone. Reduced to ashes. Nothing went according to plan. But at least the race sphere is out of the picture. John was the only person left Cole could trust, and now he's gone too. It's kind of poetic that he and the race sphere were destroyed together. Cole only has one thing left to do. Face Kessler. Something that Kessler is now ready to let happen. And here we are, back where it all started. I was so worried that you weren't gonna live through the blast. But you were fine. More than fine, actually. I remember your voice now. You were there after the bomb went off. I've always been there, Cole. Every step of your life. It all ends where it began, back at Ground Zero. You and Cole have come a long way since you were paired together here so long ago, and you'll finally learn the secrets you've been looking for since Cole woke up in this crater, which is the perfect place for the final boss both in story and gameplay. And Kessler is a great final boss. The fight is fast-paced and challenging. Kessler has a handful of attacks and you'll have to learn how to dodge each one and when to strike back to be successful. As his health drops, the fight will have two more stages with new attacks. If you try to leave the battle, Kessler will pull you back in, showing that he still has control. He wants this fight to happen and he wants you to kill him. He taunts Cole throughout the fight, telling him no one cares for him. This is Kessler's final test for Cole, and he wants to ensure that he's ready. The safest way to play is to only hit him while he's weakened after doing his lightning attack, but you can damage him at any point in the fight to kill him faster. If you mess up once, it's easier to get caught in his next attack, but the fight is fair, and when you die, it always feels like it was your fault. What is this, Dark Souls? The only issue I have with this fight is that sometimes Kessler gets caught in loops of only doing his lightning bolt attack, which can be blocked with a shield. Sometimes. If you're standing still. You can cheese the fight this way, but where's the fun in that? Is this the end of all the endings? When you defeat Kessler before he dies, he gives you another vision which reveals that he is Cole from the future. Kessler married Trish and had a family, but an extremely powerful conduit called the Beast destroyed the whole world. Kessler could have stopped the Beast, but instead he chose to run from it. Ultimately, his family died and he realized he had failed. He somehow acquired or developed the power to take a one-way trip back in time, where he took control of the First Sons and made a plan for Cole to become the savior he failed to be. Flashback to my mistakes, my rebounds, my earthquakes. Maybe some people have an issue with the time travel power just popping up out of nowhere without any explanation as to how it works or where it came from, but this game has established a world with superpowers of electricity, mind control, 
and telekinesis, as well as a secret organization with futuristic technology. So I think it fits within the established lore and also is hinted at many times throughout the story. You don't know, do you? Of course not. But you'll find out soon enough. And oh, how you're weak. Also, a sequel is clearly set up that can explain this more. Some people don't understand this ending because they are used to how time travel works in other pieces of fiction. Guess what? Traveling back in time is not possible in the real world. At least not based on what we currently know. It's an interesting science fiction concept, and it works differently in every story because it's not real and the writers make up how it works. Basically, your body will go to sleep while your mind travels back in time. As long as you're back there, past and present will continue to coexist. But once you wake up, whatever you've done will take hold and become history. In Infamous, time travel works by sending one person's body back in time, and his body is not bound to the future. If something happens to his former self, it won't affect him at all. For example, he doesn't die if his former self dies. Kessler and Cole were at one point the same person, but have become different people because they had different things happen to them, and are physically in different bodies. Wait, if Cole's powers were activated by the blast and Kessler is the same person, then wasn't he also activated by blasts caused by his former self? It's a paradox. No, Kessler was not activated in a blast by his former self. Think about it. If he had his own Kessler in the past, then he would have never married Trish. His powers were activated some other way, and it probably had to do with the First Sons. How else would he know about them? Also, that means that Alden would have been their leader in his timeline because Kessler never kicked him out and took over. So, what Kessler did to Alden was probably revenge for giving him his powers or something else that happened in his timeline. When Kessler took over the First Sons, he accelerated the Race Sphere's development so that he could give Cole powers at an earlier time than when he got them, and to teach him a lesson and tell him the beast was coming. Anyways, I made a whole video about this, if you haven't seen it. Okay, well, if Kessler went back in time to save the world from the beast, why didn't he just kill it himself? Well, Kessler's extremely guilty, and I think he considered himself a failure who didn't want to mess up again. He didn't believe in himself anymore. He wanted to create a pure version of himself who was never a coward in the first place. He prepared Cole mentally for fighting the beast by beating him down, and taking away the people he loved to make him heartless, but strong if he could push through it. Kessler probably would have killed Zeke if he hadn't turned on Cole, which was just a happy accident Kessler never planned for that made his plan work even better. Oh, how are you to know? There's many little hints sprinkled throughout the story about Kessler. The first time you play, you probably won't notice them or be able to figure out what they are hinting towards. Real tough guy, aren't you? On the contrary, I'm weak, quite weak in fact. Which is why you need to learn this lesson, and learn it well. While karma doesn't change the game a significant amount, it gives you a reason to replay it, and then you'll notice all these clues. You and Kessler are one and the same! You've got some serious issues, you know that. It's a genius way to get players to replay the game so they can appreciate how deep the story is. I don't expect you to understand any of this, Cole. Not yet, anyway. But someday... You'll thank me. Of that, I am certain. Hold on to the memories they will hold on to you. This twist ending is a great climax to the game. It's surprising, gets you excited for a sequel, and wraps a nice bow on the themes of the game. The whole time you've been choosing between selfish or selfless. Kessler was selfish and didn't care to help the rest of the world, but now, even though he's evil, he's selfless, working only to save the world, going as far as to sacrifice his wife and many other innocent people. He did evil things for an ultimately good cause which makes for a very understandable villain with moral depth. Cole doesn't want to be like Kessler, but that was Kessler's plan all along, to make this version of himself better. Cole can't help but admit that Kessler was kinda right. A stroke, a match, and blew your mind. So is the villain in Infamous actually the real hero? Kessler says that every time Cole fails, someone's world ends. Ends in the worst way imaginable. But Kessler is willingly ending people's world, so what does that say about him? He's working to save people, but does the opposite to accomplish it, contradicting himself. Kessler views being strong as lacking emotions, but aren't emotions what we live for? Still, the game doesn't give a clear answer to if Kessler is the hero. It's left up to debate, which is more interesting for this story because questions and mystery are emphasized. It gives you something to think about after completing the game. If only you weren't so shady. 
Things don't end well for Cole. From the start, he just wanted he and his friends to be okay, but they're not at all. Trish and John are dead. Moya lied to Cole, and Zeke betrayed him. Zeke feels guilty about what he did, but it doesn't change the fact that he did it. Concern you, fat man. The world is doomed, and Cole can't escape his fate of fighting the beast unless he wants to end up like Kessler. Cole has been emotionally broken, but has come to accept the responsibility of his powers. The good karma after credit scene shows Cole like this, alone but determined. He's gained the trust of Empire City, but his problems aren't over yet, and he's unsure if he can deliver on their expectations. Zeke, I don't know what to think. I've never been more alone. The evil after credit scene shows Cole as a guy totally corrupt with power who rules over Empire City and gets what he wants from the weak. It's really cheesy and it seems he hasn't learned Kessler's lesson. These powers are only good for one thing, letting me take what I want, when I want. In a place with no law, the strong take what they want, and the weak are their slaves, their playthings. And no one is stronger than me. A sequel is clearly set up with the plot of Cole having to stop the Beast, but that's not the only thing. Zeke wants Cole's friendship back. Many aspects of Kessler's backstory are left untold, and mystery remains. Sasha, Alden, and Moya are still alive, Moya being the most important. The government wanted the race sphere and has blueprints of it. What will they do with it, and how will they respond to conduits? Lock them away? Create super soldiers for the military? Something totally different? We don't know, and that's very interesting. You think they're not gonna try and recreate the race sphere? I gave them copies of every schematic I could get my hands on. But even if that fails, they still have you. Their own personal WMD. My guess is that they'll capture you and lock you up. Only letting you out when they need somebody wiped off the map. Well, at least I'm good for something. But think about this for a second. Now, if that thing dishes out superpowers, What's to stop old Uncle Sam from juicing up the entire military, or the cops? We'd have no defense against that. The government, specifically the NSA, cut off all contact with John as he desperately tried to reach them over and over, and they didn't try to stop the blast when he warned them it would happen. They do finally respond, but John never gets the message before he dies. Agent White, this is NSA Director Houston. Your operation has been terminated. No one is blaming you for what happened. We know you did everything you could. We will have a chopper at Drop Point Zeta every day at 1650 hours. It's time for you to come home. The government may not be so different from the First Sons after all. They have secrets and unclear motives that seem malicious. She works for a different agency and knew I was undercover. That means the NSA has been compromised and someone is outing agents. Our entire national security apparatus could be exposed. Been spending a lot of time thinking about what's happened here. The CDC suddenly getting military units. FEMA acting like a law enforcement agency. No word at all from anyone in the NSA. And God knows what the FBI is doing. It seems like someone is setting the stage for a fundamental shift in the way this country works and who runs it. If we don't destroy the race fear, there could be people like Cole everywhere. And who would stop them? Nobody. There's a lot of interesting themes set up for the sequel to explore sacrifice, government control, and conduit rights. While it does end on a giant cliffhanger, the game's story is at the same time very complete. Your main questions were answered and the main conflict ended. It almost doesn't need a sequel if you just assume that Kessler's plan worked and Cole stops the beast, but there is definitely a sequel story to be told with new themes, ideas, and powers to explore. I hate everything about Kessler, but when the time comes, I will be ready. So, why the hell isn't Infamous a more popular game? Well, I don't know. But I'll take a guess at it. 
I went out to find the most common criticisms of the game, and found that Destructoid's review featuring Jim Sterling had all of these criticisms and mostly valid reasons for them. I am going to go through each one and say whether or not I agree. Karma only has one actual choice and is shoved down the player's throat. I agree. The game has a lot of glitches. I agree, although most of them aren't game-breaking. The climbing is annoying because sometimes you get magneted towards objects you don't want to climb. I agree that this can be annoying when it happens, but as you get used to how the game feels, it happens less and less because you have a better understanding of when you will or won't get magneted towards an object. Plus, pressing the circle button will make Cole drop from whatever he is currently grabbing. This is a counter to the magneting that's built into the game to help correct the issue. Once you get the feel of the climbing down, you can use this system to your advantage, and it really isn't that bothersome at all. Cole's voice is too gravelly. Screw you. I feel like this mostly comes down to personal taste, but I think Jason Cottle does a great job of portraying a broken man who is unhappy with his situation. I'm gonna kill you, Kessler. I'm gonna tear you apart, piece by piece. The main characters are not likable. Um, in a way, I agree, but I also don't. I relate to Cole simply because he's an average guy down on his luck, plus the game does a great job early on of fusing you with him. Zeke can be a little annoying when he's supposed to be, but also comedic and inherently likable with his childlike imagination and silliness. You gotta bring it back here! Sure. I could use a sidekick. Ah, hell with that! Zeke Jedediah Dunbar is his own man. Your middle name is Jedediah? Trish turns on Cole from the start, and you're never given much of a reason to care about her, so I can see how she's not likable, but she's used as a plot device to have Cole lose something important in his life early in the story. You don't feel very powerful. Yes, this is true and it's kind of the point of the story. To make you feel Cole's lack of power in life juxtaposed against him becoming superpowered. Jim Sterling says that R1 bolts are the only useful power in the game, which I completely disagree with. Based on my own experience, all of the powers except the rocket are very useful. Hey, my sister's boyfriend Alec, can you shut up? No. Okay, what, 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 why do you think that Infamous is bad? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I just, I thought the combat, and honestly, just everything in the game was very tedious. You just, you do a lot of climbing, kill a few things, climbing, kill a few things, and it just kind of seemed like that was the entire game, and I lost interest after a while. And also, it's game. Are you doing the same things over and over in Infamous? Yes. You climb and fight bad guys over and over, but I don't think it's all that different to any other game. In every game, you do the same things over and over throughout, just with different variations. I really don't feel like in Infamous all the climbing and combat scenarios are the same, because they aren't. The way Sucker Punch designed the controls and feel of the gameplay is just really fun. You get in this flow of jumping, climbing, gliding, shooting, grinding, grenading, jumping, shooting, sniping, grinding, rocketing, 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 shooting, rocketing, shooting, grinding, gliding, 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 moves along the rooftops, there's a sort of rhythm to his actions, and as a player you feel it. You zip along, you jump, you repulse gravity a little bit, you grab on to a bit of a building, climb up, see an enemy, blast him off the rooftop, and keep going. And it's, it's really addictive. Well, sometimes developers describe their games really well, and sometimes they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Over the course of the game, you end up getting another 15 or 16 uh, powers, and those powers, in addition to the ones you start off with, are all upgradable. If you multiply it all out, I think you got over 80 powers that you end up with. I've completed the game over 10 times, and I'm still not bored of its gameplay. Maybe I'm just unhealthily obsessed with the game, but what would make you think that? The fact that I spent two and a half years making this review? <laughs> um, some of them are a little bit crazy. You can see here, this kid uh, is, you know, written everything single space. He really means it. You know, this is longer than any book report he's ever done, I'm sure. <laughs> so, what are my main criticisms of the game? Well, the side missions are usually repetitive and boring, although they do give you connection to the people of Empire City and extra content if you want it, while being unnecessary for the main story. A few of those main story missions do feel like filler. There's too many bugs and glitches that break immersion, even though most don't completely ruin the game. And lastly, Karma feels unnatural and actually only gives you one choice. It could be so much more. Looking back on the game, Karma is not one of the most memorable aspects, even though the title Infamous emphasizes its importance. I have come to appreciate Karma being two different ways to view the story, and it helps bring out its themes, but doesn't add much beyond that. 
Overall, Infamous has its flaws, but none of them significantly hinder the experience, and I would still consider it to be a masterpiece. Nothing is perfect, and Infamous's parts work together to form a cohesive whole with meaningful interactions and a strong narrative. The traversal is controlled so that you feel you could do anything and go anywhere, and the combat abilities are fun and varied to the perfect degree. Together, these two systems make fights approachable in many ways and are the groundwork for a good sandbox action game. The story is a detailed and intriguing sci-fi dystopian thriller full of interesting characters with motives and personalities that make many of them unpredictable. It's a joy to play and a shocking experience. Infamous has taken us about three and a half years, which is, you know, like going to college or high school. And it's a huge commitment of time. And then you, you want to make it great, you know? You want to make something beautiful. Over the last year, it really felt like it went from kind of a hope of a game to every 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 month or every play test would be like, okay, I actually believe this is going to be a good game more and more. So, and now it's I'm I'm really happy with it. Okay, I guess I still haven't answered the question of why the game wasn't more popular. Sure, it had a few common criticisms, but overall it got very good reviews. I don't know for sure why Infamous wasn't latched onto widespread like I've latched onto it, but I think it may have to do with two other games. Prototype and Uncharted 2 Among Thieves. Building games is really, really hard. I don't think people really understand how hard it is to get an entertainment product out there that is really good in quality and, you know, you're competing with other really, really smart people to get these great games out there. Um, it is really hard work. You're really in the trenches catching hand grenades for, you know, 18 months. Prototype is an open-world superhero game that came out just two weeks after Infamous. Not everyone has enough money to buy two games that are very similar, so they have to choose which looks better. Prototype was competition for Infamous, and unlike Infamous, it wasn't an exclusive game. Infamous was only released on the PlayStation 3, but Prototype also came out on PC and Xbox 360. It had a wider potential audience. According to what little information I could find, it seems that both games sold okay, with Infamous selling slightly better better. But guess what? Prototype got a remaster and Infamous didn't. FYI, I haven't played Prototype so I can't comment on the quality of the game. But I have played Uncharted 2. The game is fantastic but I personally prefer Infamous over it. Uncharted 2 came out the same year as Infamous, 2009. Both games were action, platforming, storytelling, PlayStation 3 exclusive games. The game wasn't as much competition for Infamous as Prototype was. It came out five months later and is less similar, but these two games were the two biggest PS3 exclusives that year and would appeal to a similar audience. Uncharted 2 sold way more than Infamous and was showered in critical acclaim, making it an instant classic. I think what's fascinating about Uncharted 2 vs Infamous isn't the competition between the two, but how the differences in the games may have affected their sales and reception. Why was Uncharted 2 so much more successful than Infamous? First off, it's a sequel to a popular game, so it had brand recognition that Infamous didn't. Next, we have more appealing visuals. Uncharted 2's graphics are technologically far, far superior to Infamous's, which aren't even impressive for its time. Naughty Dog was, and still is, the leader in motion capture animation for games, as well as Uncharted 2 is just more colorful and features more environments. Unfair as it is, graphics are a big selling point for games. The industry always hypes up graphics and makes them seem more important than they really are. Uncharted 2 had better reviews, which obviously leads to better sales. But most importantly, Uncharted 2 is just easier to get into. Uncharted 2 is a light-hearted action-adventure romp with simpler gameplay. Infamous is a dark dystopian thriller disguised as a superhero game, and has more elements to gameplay. Uncharted 2 has simple puzzles, punching, grenades, cover, scripted climbing, pointless treasures to find, no upgrades, and multiple guns to shoot, but you're limited to what's currently available. Infamous is an open world, everything can be climbed, it has side missions, mostly meaningful collectibles, choices to be good or evil, and an ever-expanding list of upgradable moves for combat and traversal. On top of all this, there is a deep mystery story. Now, I'm definitely not saying Infamous is one of the most deep and complex games there is. It's far from that. But Infamous is a game that makes you think a lot more than Uncharted 2, which is more comparable to a popcorn flick. That doesn't mean that Uncharted 2 is bad or made for idiots, it's just a difference in tone and how much thought the player is putting in while playing. 
Uncharted 2 is a very fun game that appeals to a wider audience than Infamous because it's more accessible to casual gamers. Maybe I shouldn't be asking why everyone else didn't like Infamous as much as me. Maybe I should be asking myself why I like it so much when it hasn't stood out that much in the vastness of the gaming industry. Infamous has held a special place in my heart for years, and it can be difficult to pinpoint what sets it apart from other open world storytelling games, but I think a big part of it has to do with originality. You know, I don't think we wanted to just say, well, here's this comic, let's just go make it, um, and just change the character. You know, I don't think that, that would have been a huge failure for us. Infamous shakes up common superhero narratives and is different from what's already out there. It starts with Cole just being a normal person. We knew we were doing superhero, but I don't think we wanted to do it in kind of super traditional superhero way. Like the first thing we'd have to tell people is, no, he doesn't wear tights or anything like that. It's like, what if it's a regular person who would get superpowers? Other comic book heroes start as normal people too, but Cole stays that way after he gets his powers. I think anyone can see themselves in Cole unless you're an always wildly successful, perfect human being, but no one is without flaws and stupid problems in their lives. Infamous has had an even bigger impact on me lately, as I have lost two of my best friends, sorta of similar to Cole. It's an unfortunate relation to the character I wish I didn't have, but shit happens, and that's kinda what Infamous is about. Cole is not the only realistic character. All of them are. Each character is flawed and struggles with something. Zeke wants to feel special. Trish blames Cole for something he had no control over. Moya is a liar with malicious intentions. Sasha is corrupted by power. Alden is jealous of Kessler and seeks revenge. John is quick-tempered and doesn't trust anyone. Kessler didn't want responsibility and paid the price for it. He now uses violence and murder to save the world. All of these characters reflect aspects of Cole and Zeke. Zeke paints Moya as a bad guy who's lying to Cole, but then turns on Cole himself. Alden envies Kessler just like Zeke envies Cole. Sasha is who Cole will become if he uses his powers for greed. Cole is betrayed many times throughout the game, and John is who he will become if he stops trusting anyone. Cole blames Zeke, and briefly John, for what happened to Trish, just like she blamed Cole. And Kessler is literally a different version of the same character as Cole who didn't want to accept responsibility. Infamous defies superhero tropes with these characters as well. Moya is a twist on the mentor character. She leads Cole through this world and tells him what to do, but is never trustworthy and never even hints at caring for his well-being. Kessler is a twist on the villain archetype. He's trying to save the world, not destroy it. He's not firing a blue laser in the sky, releasing poisonous gas into the city, oh, wait, he kinda does, or trying to blow it up. Oh shit, he does that too. My point is, it's not his ultimate goal. He's a savior, but also a twist on the savior archetype. He doesn't really sacrifice himself for the greater good, instead he involuntarily sacrifices his future wife. He's a relatable character which makes for the best type of villain. Who the hell are you? Just a concerned citizen. The hero usually has good friends or sidekicks. Cole's best friends are either selfish or angry at him. In the end, the hero usually saves the world and gets the girl, but here we learn the world is doomed and the girl dies. These events could change the world, but Cole only cares about his personal place in all this mess. It's not about saving the world, until it is at the very end. Infamous is focused on telling a down-to-earth story, rather than on the larger universe it takes place in. And that universe is believable and realistic aside from the superpowers. The powers are kind of the, the element that's still similar to comic books, but then we're trying to marry that with a realistic environment and an art style that makes it more believable to people who aren't necessarily huge comic book fans. Infamous is not just one of the best PS3 games, it's one of the best superhero stories there is. And the best superhero stories are not focused on superpowers. They just use them as a tool to tell a story. This Eden does not exist. No, no, it's a fantasy. Okay, see that? Th th those are the names of the people who just made this... <laughs> they made this whole thing up. Okay, this whole... It happened once and they just turned it into a big fucking lie real characters that have real problems, Peter Parker has to make rent. Bruce Banner has to actually deal with being a fugitive. And Tony Stark, you know, he's, a, he's an alcoholic, and that's the type of character that, you know, Cole is. We feel that people just related to him on a level that even we didn't expect. It's a shame that Infamous wasn't a more popular game, but it still meant something special to me and many other players. 
We always try to be careful to define our criteria for success before the title comes out because it can be a little bit of a, you know, the goalpost keeper seeding as you think, oh, well, that was what we wanted. Uh, we really wanted more. And so I think that on any new intellectual property, the critical thing for us was that we made a profitable title so we could pay profits to our employees and that we got to make a sequel. And that happened. And so I, that was our definition of success. I think we proved to our, our publisher and sort of gamers that we can make a good game but what's really more important, and this sounds really lame, is that we kind of proved to ourselves that we could do it. So even if we did make a game that didn't meet with a lot of commercial success, we know that we're, we're capable. You know, we've just been lucky. Uh, I think that life and business can be kind of unfair, and in our case, it's, it's unfair in our favor. And that we've been lucky in that we've been able to work on projects that everybody believed in, that everyone really cared about. Not all companies can. You know, sometimes you're in a position where you just have to take some work to keep the doors open, right? And you end up working on, I don't know, <laughs> Rugrats port or something. It's hard to say anything without, you know, pissing all over somebody's project. Upon the release of Infamous One, the thing that really kind of stuck with me, I was I was going to E3 and I was wearing an infamous shirt. I was on the, the subway in LA and this random dude comes up to me and says, Oh, Infamous. Hey, that's a good game. That was it. I didn't say that I worked on it. I just thought, well, that's super random that this dude would just make a point of telling me that. That was my favorite thing that I got. I want to thank the amazing people at Sucker Punch for making a game that was able to connect to me so much. On the surface, Infamous is a game about being powerful and making choices, but it's actually about the opposite. The karma system is an illusion. No matter what you choose, the story ultimately plays out in nearly the exact same way. Karma may be flawed, but the way it's presented is actually genius. You're not powerful. You don't have control over everything in your life, no matter how hard you try or want to. Sometimes life really sucks, and you get thrown into shitty situations, and it's not your fault. There's nothing that you can do to avoid this, because you can't control everything. You're only human. Maybe you're stuck in a citywide quarantine after a violent disaster. Maybe your girlfriend leaves you because of a misunderstanding. Maybe you get manipulated and lied to by someone or don't like your boss. Maybe your best friend stabs you in the back when you thought you could always trust them. Maybe you lose someone you love forever. Maybe you're forced to face something you don't want to do. Maybe your infamous review won't end up as perfect as you always imagined it. Maybe your video game won't get the popularity and acclaim it deserves. There's so much that can happen to you that you can't prevent, but you do have control over your own actions. When bad things happen, you have the choice to give in to negative thoughts and cynicism, caring only for yourself, or to be optimistic and responsible doing what will ultimately be best for you and the people around you. You are a seemingly unimportant person with the power to do great things. But it will never matter if you don't have the strength and determination to push forward through hard times and put however much power you do have to use. It's important that you don't do the wrong thing or miss your chances because, well, you don't have time travel powers. Anyways, our next comment comes from Sad Kitten 345 who says, Imagine a conduit with shit powers. That would be a very unique power. Here is what the shit power would look like. When you're good, it's more of a lighter color, and when you're evil... What stupid power idea is it this time? May I speak to the pyro gunner? Who is this? Who are you? The pyro gunner. <laughs> Good. Let's begin.